Um, so I'd like to welcome to the stage um, Dave Hammond, Ross Charters, Russell Rafton, uh, John Avent, and Paul Harrington, please. There's no point in sitting down. We are tight for time, so okay. 10 minutes, so I'll let you crack on. Right. Hey, that works. Uh, good afternoon. Um, last week I was in Spain uh, doing the two days theory of a five day course on heat treatment for insect control, which is the minimum that we assess people need. So um, I've got uh, now nine minutes um, to give you just the briefest insight onto um, insect control and heat treatment in the property care sector. I've got a legal disclaimer out there because it's not um, us or um, our advice or equipment that causes problems, it's people that cause problems and ignorance and a lack of understanding of just how much damage heat treatment can do to buildings. There's literally been millions of pounds worth of damage done by ignorant people over the last um, 25 years that I've been involved in, in doing this. So, what is heat treatment for pest control? Well, basically, 52 degrees on the insect for a temperature of one hour will kill all eggs, larvae, pupae, and adults of um, insects. It works by denaturing proteins, and proteins and enzyme activity, if you look at the graph, stops at, um, at 52 degrees. And actually, um, the denaturing starts really from the low 40s upwards. Um, Heat killed, as I said, by uh, disrupting enzyme activity, but we're only talking about um, uh, insect control here. We're not talking about vertebrates or bacteria or, or viruses. Fungi, moot point, we'll discuss later with the PCA. So, how do insects get hot? Well, the object is to get the heat transmitted from our heaters by convection to the material that we're heating up, whether that's uh, uh, timber, which is what we're normally talking about here, or food production machinery, which you'll see from our um, stands out there, um, to penetrate right through to kill the eggs and the um, beasts hidden therein. Now, in the laboratory, uh, eggs are um, the most um, e difficult to kill, and adults the easiest to kill because they're more complex. In the, in the wild, the adults can run around and try and hide from the heat, and the eggs are stuck there on the substrate in which they are um, living. If you want to take issue with any of the target temperatures, there is a mass of information on this paper. Um, the targets that we have adopted have just been the sort of high end of, of everything, so we beat everything, everything there. Now, heat treatment understand, it, it requires an understanding of physics, and it's different from other forms of pest control. So the energy you require for any, to heat anything up is basically its mass, times specific heat capacity of the material you're heating up, times the temp temperature change. Okay, um, and you can see from this that um, compared to steel, which is what, or um, metals, that what we might be heating up for food production machinery, um, wood has got about sort of five times specific, specific heat capacity, um, and obviously different woods are slightly different. Um, so you do need more energy and more time to get the heat to penetrate where we want it. Furthermore, wood is complicated by having water in it. And as you can see from, from this, the, um, the latent heat evaporation needed for water takes a huge amount of energy out of any um, heat treatment. So if you're heating up moist timber, just as the sweat coming off our brow when we, um, when we get hot cools our whole body down, the evaporation of just a tiny little bit of water well, the evaporation of just the tiniest bit of water from timber, from the surface of timber, drags that energy from inside and can take heat from the core of the wood, which is where we want it. And of course, when we're measuring temperatures, which you'll see from our temperature monitoring systems outside, um, we have to drill right into the center of that wood to measure that the heat has got exactly where we want it to go. So management of water is absolutely crucial in um, and understanding the behavior of water, which we you know, which is why I was so interested in the first presentations um, this morning. Um, I'm going to give you literally nothing more than a, um, a picture of what heat treatment actually looks like. Um, this is just from this Christmas. It's a, um, a billionaire's Mayfair club. Uh, I don't recognize anyone here from um, being a membership there. But basically, uh, woodworm larvae were dropping out of this uh, overhead uh, cladding. They hadn't used um, kiln-dried wood. They'd just taken... 
uh, natural wood just as a facade. They weren't um, uh, um, structural. And we're dropping onto the food of the uh, millionaires and billionaires eating below. So we literally underdrew all of that, cooked it um, overnight, um, drilled our dummy blocks into, um, into the timbers and run heat into the ceiling above so we could sandwich the wood there. And um, I can, if that hadn't have worked, I imagine we would have heard of it by now. Um, so that was obviously uh, very successful. Um, and you can see here the heaters, um, and there's three of these uh, 25 kilowatt um, heaters of ours, cook, you know, putting the heat into, um, into the area for the treatment. As with, uh, I've mentioned uh, um, timber is important, uh, sorry, water is important. So if we see any cracks that are already there, we photograph them, put a line across the end or something and measure them to make sure there is no movement of, uh, of cracks or any other damage, and that we've got evidence before and after to make sure there is no movement. One of our earlier heat treatments, this is Larnaca Water Museum. Um, our thermical systems are in 25 countries around the world now, um, and in Cyprus they do a lot of heat treatment of timber. Um, and this was done over three days, um, just a, same sort of principle, heating up, putting temperature sensors into the um, thickest piece of timber in the corners where heat is less likely to penetrate, um, and then covering over the roof and doing it in actually in three sections. Um, We've been working with the PCA um, to try and understand, um, because we don't understand buildings. We're, we're pest, con pest controllers, pest management people. So we need your expertise um, to work with, with buildings. And so we're having um, Steve and James came out to help do the measurements as we did some spot treatments here on a sort of damp cottage in Derbyshire. Um, here we're doing this, the stairs. Um, there you can see um, a beam in the kitchen, which we've sheeted over. And you can see on the, um, the Smeg fridge there, um, the massive dummy block that we were using to um, measure the penetration of the heat um, at the furthest point from where the heat was, was going in. Um, and I know somebody asked me um, just in the coffee break, what can we do about furniture? Well, the lady had brought woodworm into her house by a variety of um, various furniture she bought at um, antiques fairs or whatever and managed to infest her house. At the end of the day, we get a graph um, which gives us this. Somebody also asked us about churches. Um, uh, this is the, doing the roof of a church in Nottinghamshire um, over, I think it's two to three days this project was. Uh, the roof had already been scaffolding around it, so we had to sheet it below and top to contain the heat within the areas that, um, that we wanted. Um, we've had a lot of experience through what's called ISPM 15, which is um, heat treatment of pallets. We make these converted kilns. Um, and it's a different heat treating process for this, but here we have to reach 56 degrees for 30 uh, minutes as an international standard um, for phytosanitary measures. And as you can see here, we have to sort of drill um, into the wood to make sure this 56 degrees is achieved everywhere um, for the 30 minute period. Um, you're all familiar with health and safety assessments. Part of this was uh, my trip to Camp Basti in Afghanistan where all of our um, pallets for the troops coming home had to be heat treated with one of our systems that we'd built there. And there on your right is the health and safety clothing required for this visit. Um, and this, this, the briefing started with, um, in the event of the air raid alarm, um, don your health and safety um, equipment and uh, lie down by the nearest blast wall until the all clear sounds. Um, so that was fun. Um, we can also do this all over the world. This is in South Africa. We have heat treatment containers. So the actual knowledge of heating up timber is quite um, is is not new to us. What is new to us is the um, uh, the effects on buildings. So we we pick and choose our battles. Um, so we don't cause any damage and touch wood. Uh, Thermical Limited has never had any um, insurance claims to date. Um, which is not the same for many people who've tried heat treatment, um, where some of the claims have gone into millions. So please, out there, do not be tempted to do this at home. Um, as I say, we've been used to, this is hence my enthusiasm quickly on drying earlier, um, we use drying and redu reduction in relative humidity of uh, houses to, to control fungus beetles, book lice, plaster beetles and mites, particularly in new build houses that haven't dried out properly. And Steve will raise a question of um, the balance between heat and, um, and ventilation later. Um, that's an ongoing project. If anyone um, would like to partner us or, um, or sponsor research work, um, we are very open to um, discussions here. Next question is anything you don't understand. 
I wrote this uh, 10 years ago. Um, it's, a, it's a snip at that, but you can pay me 500 quid a day to come and read it to you. Uh, there's a copy outside. Okay, am I within the time? Thank you. <laughs> you can stay up there on spectacle. Right, thank you very much. Uh, we will be doing, well, we won't be doing Q&A, but if you want to go and ask these folks any questions, they'll all be out the back, and you're more than welcome to go and say hello. So, Ross, up you come. Hello, everybody. Well, I'm here today to talk about ground penetrating radar. So, ground penetrating radar is making the invisible visible. And the question I always get asked is, how did I get into GPR? Short story, I was working for a lady, she's an archaeologist, a lovely lady, she's done a lot of stuff in Egypt, and she was basically telling me how reliable it is looking at drainage stuff and finding all these sort of things. And she had a lot of problems with her property. If anyone follows me on social media, she was the one where the fencer put the post straight through the drain and it saturated her house. Now, basically from there, I had to find how, how to use this and, you know, have a little trial on it. I got chatting to a chap I know. He said, come on over to my farm and have a play. So we went over to his farm and had a play. Not like that. And I was literally <laughs> mind blown. I couldn't believe it. It was, like, pretty easy to find all the drainage stuff and what have you. Um, and it just went from there, basically. So that's how it basically works. I just got a little video. So there's me just... Going, I'm, I'm going in a line now, and you can see I'm just putting some little flags down, and that's basically highlighting where you've got the drainage going along there. Now, James Berry, he done the talk about the Public Health Act 1875, where everybody thought physical DPCs were actually part of it. But before that, we had the bylaws, and we had in there, we had lots of stuff about sub subsoil drainage, like land drains. And the earliest reference I found next to me was in Warminster, and that was 1868. So, these are the ones I have found over the years. So, the third one in is the one where it got my sort of information about it all, because we kept finding the one, third one in from the left, we kept finding these when we were digging the ground levels around. And that is what we kept finding, and we were thinking, why were these there? But these were part of the bylaws, obviously to deal with damp issues. Hidden wells, you can find hidden wells. So the left-hand one at the top, that's a very deep, that's from a recent survey. So sometimes, for even from a health and safety perspective, <clears throat> if they've been covered over, you've got a bit of concrete or a bit of steel, lots of them are corroding. I'm sure you building surveyors have seen them. Bottom left-hand one there, you can see there was a drain actually in there, pipe in there. Now, the other one on the other right-hand side there, you've got two pipes coming in. If you think about a well, and we're thinking about damp, lots of wells had puddled clay around them. So they actually waterproof. As soon as you put a pipe through there, it's basically allowing water to come out if that water is high enough, and it's like having a tap on. And on this one here, you can see I'm pumping the well out on this one, and you can see, you know, there's a, there was a big problem with this one. I got another, it's a longer video for it to be fair. Cisterns, rainwater harvesting, something we probably need now. These were you know quite common. There's all different designs there. That left-hand picture there, you can see um, that was underneath a floor of property, completely flooded out, rotted out. There was other things going on there, to be fair, but you can see the middle picture. You can see that was one of the outlets for it. So obviously when this water come out, come in, it had to get out as well. <clears throat> and obviously all of that sort of stuff when there's been changed. So with this one, we actually worked out where all the pipes were using GPR. Culverts. That's my favourite one, to be fair. On these ones here, this was an older building, and you can see, this is reference, this is a nice flat top. If you're putting a camera down them, you really need to be careful because you can lose them if obviously there's lots of things that can get snagged up on, and you can see some of them are blocked up. When I was at this project with a civil engineer, he was going through it, we actually thought all these culverts would go into like a ditch around the property. They actually didn't, we both got it wrong. Um, but with the GPR, we mapped out exactly where they are too, and obviously you can facilitate cleaning on there. And this one here, is it a property? There's me little girl there. She got paid a tenner for the day. And she doesn't normally come to work, but it's for somebody I know. If you can see on here, you've got the flat top, which is reference to them culverts on there. On this one property, it was a three-way culvert since I've never seen before. Um, and this was all going off to a land, um, oh, like the balancing pond. And on the neighbour's property, they had all of their drains coming through to it as well. Something you wouldn't have really found without this. French drains, love them or hate them. They're here to stay. Lots of these get put around buildings to deal with damp. Nobody knows actually where they are. 
I found three as a record around a building. This one here is a classic example. If you look at this, uh, it's like up and down like a BMX track. That is actually poop soup. Somebody's connected that to the sewer, all backed up, probably a very good fertiliser. There's lots of plants growing there, I should imagine. And then, believe it or not, it was full up with um, wet wipes. So confined utilities, this picture here, somebody had a bill for 40,000 gallons of water. They had the stopcock off over winter. It was a sports field. We had to find the mains um, water for them. But typically, gas, electric, and mains, you can find that stuff. We do a lot of lower and the ground level, so you've got lots of things to think about where you've got all these sort of services for health and safety points of view. Repairs. Porcelain tile patios now. There's so many of them out there. Graham Coleman, over in the corner, he's got a resin drive. He's the only person I know who's got one. They're so expensive. <laughs> Tarmacking and all that. I've got the little gravel one on the end there. So I deal a lot with problems. Soakaways are such a big problem for me. If you could imagine with those soakaways, it can be difficult to repair them, to get all the cameras in and clean them out. If you put GPR across the drive, you can go into the grass area, dig it out, cut into the pipe, and you can clean it and line it from there. So it's such a common problem we're coming across now. So in my opinion, GPR fits in well with a joint methodology. I'm not saying everybody's going to use it, but I get involved in some absolutely weird jobs, um, and it's definitely another tool that certainly helps me for excess moisture issues. And if you're interested in some gadgets at lunchtime, you've got some, I've been doing some stuff with some well surveys. Um, you can see these ones, bits and bobs here. Um, we can have a little chatty. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ross. Well done. Yeah, you brought us back about four minutes. So well, spot on. Russell, do you want to come up? I press that one. Nice. Uh, quick introduction for those people that I've never met. Uh, this is me, Russell Rafton. I'm a director and surveyor for DryFix Preservation Limited in New York. We're a preservation company uh, specialising in damp diagnostics, um, timber treatment, decaying infestation, leak detection, structural repair, and water damage. So today, I'm going to talk to you about the development of our uh, inspection robot, uh, which achieved a commendation for innovation at the Property Care Association Best Practice Awards in 2022. Um, so the bespoke inspection robot was really developed over a period of two years with the aim of providing us the ability to access and inspect inaccessible or dangerous voids and cavities in buildings. So this is also me. This is doing the most glamorous part of my job, which is observing, surveying and note taking. But unfortunately, that's really where the niceties end because in buildings are complex structures. There are often hidden voids and cavities where various structural element elements exist that need to be examined. And the reality is that not all of these voids and cavities are easily accessible. So this is really where the concept of the inspection robot came from. So this is again me. Um, right here I'm donning some protective equipment, getting ready to access some of these nasty voids on the left. I'm going up into a roof void filled with nasty fiberglass insulation. And on the right, I'm just getting ready to squeeze my fat body through a small crawl space. The problem with these voids and crawl spaces is they're not pleasant environments. They're often shallow with a restricted ability to maneuver. They're dark, humid, sometimes fragile, and often littered with dangers. And here's an example of some of the things that I've had to crawl through. So, you can see the void space on the left-hand side here is littered with collapsed building debris, unstable material. And on the right, this is a floor structure which has had to be temporarily supported with props. Void spaces can also be dumping grounds for um, prior building activities, such as in these examples where we've got waste material, glass, fiberglass, insulation, brick, timber, and other discarded building materials. I'm pretty sure if any of you have had to enter a subfloor or a roof void, you've probably seen very similar circumstances thinking, I'm not going down there. 
Poorly conditioned vortices can also create the ideal habitat for the germination of wood destroying fungi and moles, etc. So they're very unpleasant environments, sometimes with a high level of toxicology. And we've got to remember that roof voids and floor spaces are also the environment where most plumbing and electrical services are routed through buildings. And uh, again, not all of those are safe and not all of those have been isolated before you squeeze your tight body in them. We must also consider that some of the buildings we're instructed to survey have some level of historical or architectural value. They're lifted, listed buildings or buildings that have preservation orders on them. So the risk of damage we've really got to minimise. And here's just a, a few examples of some of the buildings, unsafe structures really, that I've had to survey over the years. Um, the, when, when they're old, the, the condition of these buildings isn't always known until we get in there to assess it. So we can often find ourselves in some pretty dangerous and unstable environments. And then finally, there's the loan surveyors aspect of surveying, which I'm sure many people in this room right now um, are too. Uh, this happened to be my client's cat who decided he was going to invite himself into the sub floor while I was outside putting on my protective equipment and things like that give you a right shock when you poke your head up in a dark environment and see two red beady eyes looking at you. So the idea of using technology to assist my inspection of voice spaces actually came many years ago and I started first experimenting with various other types of technology such as pole cameras. The disadvantages however are that they're often difficult to manoeuvre, they're difficult to orientate, most don't have independent lighting, and the view is very restricted. So this is, oh, sorry, there's some examples of pole camera inspections. You can see us here looking at chimneys, and in the bottom left example here, we've knocked out a few bricks in the external walls to allow us to view a subfloor. But again, very, very difficult and challenging. And this is initially where uh, the concept of a remote inspection robot came from. Something that I could use remotely to survey these environments with safety and ease in mind. But I didn't quite realize at this time how challenging that concept was going to be. There are already lots of robots on the market for inspecting drains, for search and rescue operations, uh, marine robots for oil rigs. And now you've even got robots that can spray nasty foam insulation under your floors or even waterproofing chemicals on your external walls. Um, but how hard could it be? So, luckily I've got a geeky friend, and uh, together we ordered 101 million parts from the internet, and uh, we decided to build our own inspection robot, which you can see here. This was, um, this was powered by AA batteries, it was equipped with a rotating arm, it had a live stream GoPro camera. Admittedly, it was a little bit avagoary, but it gave us a better understanding of our requirements. The reality was, it probably wasn't tough enough for the job and the environments we were gonna put it in. Um, but that's it there. You can see we had a pretty good go at, uh, at achieving what we were after. So after that, I started looking at existing robots that were already on the market. As I mentioned before, there are many different robots out there, but most are designed and built for different purposes and different environments. And they vary massively in, in terms of cost, functionality, and of course, price. Because the price was a big factor. These things vary from anywhere between three to a hundred thousand pounds. So from that point on, after hours of research, I realized I had to build a concept around strict criteria. Because if I didn't, the possibilities were endless. So I narrowed my main criteria down to four main objectives. First of all, is that a flag? No, oh, go backwards. Can I go back? I can. Yeah. First of all, it had to be small enough to be deployed in a small inspection hatch. So I was initially aiming for something about nine by six inches. Secondly, it had to be capable of navigating difficult terrain. So that's climbing over rubble, floor joists, ceiling joists, insulation, and through damp environments. Third, and probably the most important part, had to be the camera. I needed a really high quality digital camera with optical zoom and tilt capabilities. That was the non-negotiable part of the spec. And finally, I needed independent lighting because most of these environments are dark. So I needed a combination of flood and probably spotlighting too. And of course, 
The list of other considerations was endless. I mean, this included digital analog signaling, whether to put a tether on it or not, controller with a live viewing interface, front rear cameras, rotating arms, the list just went on and on. Unfortunately, however, the reality is the more additional features we add impacts the cost, the size, the battery consumption. Therefore, to bring it within any sort of reasonable budget, I had to stick to this main criteria. And at that point, I decided to email literally every robotics company in the world to see if anybody was interested in taking on my concept. And then I got a little lucky break. I stumbled across a company in Scotland called Spectix, and they were really helpful. They came back to me, we discussed my intentions, and they liked the idea of what I was trying to achieve, and that there was nothing else on the market that filled this criteria. The problem was that with the exception of building my own Avagoari robot powered by AA batteries, owning a drone and some drain cameras, I'd never had the experience of actually using a robot for the purpose that I was intending to use it for. So, without hesitation, Spectix agreed to send me a robot. Now, this is robot, and it was initially designed for search and rescue operations. But it gave me an idea to understand what criteria I really needed. And, and this is it. I mean, this is a 40,000 piece of kit, and they sent me that completely free of charge, and they even paid for the postage. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so during this trial, I got a reply from an American robotics company who liked the idea of what I was trying to achieve. They too have been working on developing an inspection robot, but they didn't fully understand the needs and requirements from a building surveying perspective. So we teamed up. My job, my role was to provide them with all the requirements for the robot, and then they would build it. And when successful, they would take it to market and it would become a product that everybody could purchase if they wanted. So from then on, we, start, we went back to the drawing board and we started looking at options. We started looking at options for steering, whether we were using uh, tank tracks or, or, or wheels, motor options, climbing capabilities, camera options. I mean, the list was just endless. And then you've got to bear in mind that all this was done remotely. So they're, they're in America, I'm in the UK, and all this correspondence was done via email and videos, etc. So in order for me to fully understand the concepts of what we were developing, I had to get creative. And that meant building cardboard models of our plans at home in my kitchen so I could understand how big this thing was gonna be and how it was gonna work. And here are some of the schematics of the designs that led up to the concept um, during, during the, the build stage. So yeah, it, was, it, was, it was quite challenging. Uh, this is a schematic of the, almost the end design that we came up with with the retorting arms. I managed to get some of the extra features into it that I wanted um, without compromise, really. So once we'd sort of completed the design of the robot, we then started looking at controller options. Um, this was a little less intensive than the actual robot design itself, but we still need to, to focus on things like the camera display, digital signaling, size of the screen, because they're all important. It's all right getting a great live feed, but if you're viewing it on a screen three inches by three inches, then it's no good. Um, and then this came the interesting point. So at this point onwards, it was a fun bit. They actually took the design, they built a prototype in America, and they sent it over to us in the UK for trial. And we trialed this robot um, for about six weeks, and I stuck it in every nook and cranny, hull and roofoid I could find, and it was brilliant. Uh, but we did need to make some changes. We made changes to the steering, we made changes to the main camera, the signal strength, and then it was sent back to America. The changes were made, and they sent that back to us. And that's my happy face in the office there, finally taking receipt of um, our remote inspection robot, which in, in reality took somewhere between 18 months and two years to go from concept to completion. So yeah, it made me very pleased to, to actually finally get hold, of, to get hold of the finished product. And as I said now, it's on the market, people could buy them, I don't make any money out of it. I'm, I'm just happy to have used my skills and experience to develop it. Um, we are also now working on a, a miniature version, so something that doesn't have the capabilities that this one has, which is slightly more within most people's budgets. So, yeah, um, that's it. So, 
probably from here, I'm just going to leave you with Fraser, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about the actual robot and what we use it for. Hi, my name is Fraser, and I'm the contracts manager for DriveFix here in York. And I'm here to show you something we've been working hard on the past two years, called the Glimpse Inspection Robot. The Glimpse Inspection Robot was an idea created for necessity. We recognise our clients are often faced with the dilemma of either a surveyor's best guess or an intrusive survey to find the answer to their problems. By developing this bespoke robot, we can provide our clients with the answers to their problems with minimal disruption and in a safe and efficient manner. The Glimpse Inspection Robot makes the unsafe and previously inaccessible now accessible. The Glimpse Inspection Robot is small and lightweight, making it ideal to be placed beneath buildings under subfloors and can easily traverse over fragile ceilings and structures. It's equipped with both spot and flood lighting to illuminate dark environments and incorporates two front and rear facing high definition cameras with manual focus, pan, zoom and tilt functionality. For manoeuvrability, the Glimpse is equipped with track steering and incorporates 360 degree rotating arms, allowing the robot to climb over difficult terrain such as subfloor debris ceiling joists and insulation. The rear is also equipped with a large rotating tailgate, which allows the robot to climb upstairs and over obstacles up to a height of six inches. The tailgate can even be used to right itself. The Glimpse provides a real-time high-definition live feed to our surveyors, enabling them to observe any environment all from the safety of a controller. The Glimpse can even be equipped with additional accessories such as thermal imaging and data loggers, allowing it to locate leaking pipes and record atmospheric conditions. If you're interested and want to know more information about the Glimpse, feel free to give our office a call or visit our website, graphics.net. Thank you. You don't need to do that. It's out the back, so you can go look at it out there. But um, next, could we please have uh, John? Could you come up? Uh, hi. hi, everyone. I'm John Avent. I'm a structural engineer with Man Williams, uh, based in Bath. And um, I've come here to talk about some work that we've been doing over the last 12 years and to try and summarise that in, in 10 minutes. Um, biggest challenge I've had ever. So um, I guess the common thread that's come out of everything we all talk about is understanding structures. And the more we can understand structures, the more we can make informed decisions. And as structural engineers, we get presented with um, a lot of assessments, a lot of perceived defects, things like that. And an assessment of structures involves, often involves assumptions being made. And those assumptions often stack one on top of the other. And before you know it, you've made assumptions on material properties, assumptions on safety factors, assumptions on loading, assumptions of how a sometimes complex structure works. And without realising it, you can be into sort of factors of three, four, five, or, or even more in terms of the conservatism that has been applied to the assessment. So born out of that, we, we started looking at ways of understanding structures more and um, uh, and trying to do that as non-invasively as possible because um, there's various traditional techniques that uh, exist for, for load testing and they can be costly and um, uh, and invasive and we started looking at um, the way that we could see how structures perform and um, And we came up with a slide here is showing some of the um, the sort of traditional techniques. This was a, a, a historic um, cantilevered stone staircase being assessed, and it was stacked up with concrete blocks, uh, big scaffolding put in. I think anyone would view that as as, a, as an invasive solution. Um, 
and you get very, very limited information. You get, you get results back in, in sort of single point areas. So born out of this came uh, what we generically refer to as dynamic testing. And um, it has the benefits of you avoid all the big concrete blocks, the scaffolding, the cost, the invasion. And it's based around putting, I suppose the, the simple analogy is when you go into a, a room and you, and you, and you and surveyors do the, the, the heel drop and they make that slightly subjective assessment of how strong the floor is. Oh, it's a bit springy, oh, it's a bit, this one's a bit weak. And, and it was starting to put science to that, that process. Um, and born out of that came, at the moment we've got three, three test rigs that we use for various applications. Um, it can be used on, I mean, the, the, the number of structures it can be used on is, is sort of pretty limitless, really. Um, I'll, I'll skip through because some of these, I think I've had the warning about too many slides, <laughs> so I'll skip through some of these. Um, but it's, it, it's the background, and as I say, the heel drop, um, the heel drop and the, and the sort of subjective analogy of that, and then out of that has come these rigs that can look at floors, roofs, balustrades, um, literally any structure that, that needs to, uh, we need to understand its capacity. Um, we also have this slight fixation on, on defects and concern over defects. And actually, certainly as a structural engineer, we're not really interested in what's been lost. What we're interested in is what's left. So assessing what's left is, 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 is really, to my mind, the focus. Um, there's been cases where, where we've assessed structures that have lost 50% of their, of their actual structure through, through timber decay, and yet they were still fit for purpose. So, um, as I say, that's what we're interested in, in what's, what's left. Um, I'll come on, just, just do a quick case study. Um, uh, this was a, a project we worked on. Actually, I'm just going to do the first one, which is the, um, the Tropical Fruit Warehouse in Dublin. And um, these were the trusses, um, thir 30 trusses, 30 and a half metre span. Um, client, client wanted them taken apart to assess them. He wanted... Um, to assess every joint, and uh, the the ridiculousness of that request was 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 quite bizarre. Um, in truth, we would have looked at them in situ and and done a, done an inspection and been happy with their capacity. But there were repairs that needed doing. There were defects, um, but we fought hard um, to to convince the the client um, that they could be tested and we can analyze them. And by putting these uh, dynamic impulses into the structure, we were then able to develop a model that matched the responses of the structure. And the responses of the structure allowed us to, to take into account all the connections and all the aspects of the trust that, that went beyond the material, just the material properties, but it also went into fixity of joints and how that truss was working as an assembly. And again, one of these, if, if you do a uh, sort of an, an analy analytical assessment based on assumed properties, again, you're building in, you're immediately building in a, a raft of assumptions and, um, and safety factors. Whereas the way we were doing it was to find out exactly how that truss was performing and to work out exactly what its load capacity was. Um, and this was some of the work sort of progressing and this was one of the models that that came out of the out of the testing and the the upshot was that the trusses were all retained we didn't take anything apart the the defective end bearings were successfully repaired and um, and they were, and they're now back in back in place thankfully when it could have just been a pile of firewood left on the on the warehouse floor This was um, this was one that relates probably to the to the kit that we've got out the back that you can come look at. This was a balustrade 
tester. Um, this was the Poncasulti. <laughs> my pronounce, I, I apologize for my pronunciation, but uh, Telford's masterpiece. Um, and we spent a week testing, uh, testing the balustrades. There's lots of safety concerns and um, the kit allowed us to, to properly understand how the, the, the original genius of an engineer had, had conceived this river in the sky, as they call it. And um, we tested every 305 metres long, I think about a thousand balustrades. And we, we worked our way along over a week, testing them more first time ever. And we had, and we got very, very detailed um, responses back and it was the ability was for us to understand exactly how the balustrade was working so this would be a graph of a of a of a, of a good um, robust balustrade but these were various defects that were picked up from the from the testing and things that couldn't be t picked up by visual assessment um, I'll briefly scan through this one as I'm sure time is running this is just going on to some of the other aspects that we're doing in terms of remote monitoring. Uh, this was a windmill in, in Northern Ireland and understanding how the structure worked. Again, looking at dynamic responses and being able to instrument the, uh, the SLU arrangement and get that data back again to understand how the structure was working. Um, current status, we've got the three rigs uh, that we're successfully using, it's been developed over right, the last 12 years, patent applications running at the moment, we've done uh, various model testing against uh, the equivalent um, traditional techniques of static loading and we've got excellent correlation from, from the results and um, continuing to use it and happy to chat to anyone afterwards. Last but not least, Paul. Call out a beard. So, um, thank you to the PCA for giving me this um, slot, the last one before lunch. Thanks to my colleague John Bradley for not attending and uh, giving me two days' notice to do this presentation. And thanks to Ross for introducing me to the term poo soup. So, I've been doing this for nearly 30 years, and in truth, there's not been a lot of innovation in our industry. Sure, fans, you know, consume a little bit less energy than they used to, um, and there's some of them move a little bit more air, but pretty much a bathroom fan's a bathroom fan is a bathroom fan. So, we got um, uh, asked to get involved in this project, which was to develop um, a sub-4 fan. Um, and, and it really came out of a, a true partnership uh, between us as a fan manufacturer and, and PCA members that were badgering us, stalking us for, for products to, to, to solve problems that they were seeing day to day. Um, hopefully, I'll generate a bit of enthusiasm for it. it, it I mean, I'm quite laid back, hope that comes across, but um, it, it genuinely is a, a, a product that, um, that, that, you know, floats my boat it, it's it, I'm absolutely certain it's going to be our biggest selling product it's um you know with the, the amount of calls we get on a daily basis for it, it's phenomenal so here's the problem um thanks to Nick Behu for providing um the slide it's self-evident and I'm pretty sure it's the type of stuff that you guys see on a on a daily basis um there's guidance in place um, on, on what to do if you find a subfloor that is inadequately ventilated. Um, there's the PCA own, owns guidance, which, and, which also refers to approved um, document C. And, and what it tells us is that where there's inadequate uh, um, ventilation to a subfloor void, that's when that's been identified, additional air bricks should be uh, specified. So these types of things go in. Um, and this is what we would deem within the ventilation industry, a passive ventilation system or a natural ventilation system. So it simply allows air in and out and providing you've got a decent path 
a way to come in and out, then that'll work fine. Problem is, of course, that, that you know, as we grow as a nation, we develop our homes. So what previously might have been a perfectly um, suitable natural ventilation system gets blocked off because we'll do something like an extension. Um, mechanically assisted ventilation systems should be considered where additional air bricks are not possible. So how is that done? Well, in truth, it's done using products that are not really designed for subfloor ventilation. Um, great for me, I'm a sales guy, um, but the, and these products are, are typically you know, quite expensive, but there's real issues with, with applying them and applying them correctly. Um, suitability is a big one, right? Subfloor uh, voids, we know from the studies that have been done, have an incredible uh, temperature range. And, and that temperature range falls outside of the typical temperature range that our fans are made for. So in truth, if you were to use them in that environment and the fan failed, the likelihood is, is that you wouldn't get any kind of warranty for it because you've used it in an application that it's not intended for. Um, Flexibility is an issue. All of these fans do really is move air. They'll suck in air one side and blow it out the other. And if you turn it around, it'll suck air in one side and blow it out the other. So that's all they, they, they're really designed to do. Maintenance, of course, is an issue. The, the, these fans typically get installed in the subfloor. Um, everything that we make is, 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 it requires maintenance. The warranties that we provide you are dependent on that maintenance being done. So if you are doing it properly, and I'm not suggesting that any of you are not, but you will have to provide access so that that fan can be maintained going forward. Capital cost, as, as, as I said, is, is an issue. These are expensive pieces of kit. Um, running costs as well, because these things are designed to move big, big volumes of air, um, it is also uh, a, an issue, along with noise. But not just noise associated with the fact that they're moving big chunks of air, Actually, something really strange happens with modern EC motors is that when you turn them down um, uh, as much as you can, they squeal. It's just an, an electronic noise that happens. So, so these are the products that, are, that have uh, been, been used to date. So what have we done about it? I hear you all saying. So we developed um, the Mori uh, WMF, uh, which is a weatherproof fan, externally mounted. Um, and designed specifically for um, the subfloor environment. Um, when we were uh, taking advice from industry and speaking to people that were me mechanically ventilating subfloors um, on a daily basis, we, we, we found a couple of anomalies. Uh, they, they were um, specialists that, that would only ever supply air into a subfloor. And, and they were an equal amount of people that was only ever extract from a subfloor. So it was important that we had a product that kind of did whatever the, the designer wanted it to do. Um, it's weatherproof and it's housed in a, a metal casing. That's because it's got to be robust, right? So, you know, think of footballs and things like that, or rugby well, in my neck of the woods, um, hitting the, the outside of them. So they've got to be uh, robust. Um, well, one of the things that you might not, um, it might not jump out to you straight away, but these, these fans move incredibly small volumes of air. Um, so when we're looking at sizing a, a subfloor system, although there's no guidance yet, right, there is some that, that will hit, hit the ground in the not too distant future, there, there's no guidance yet. So what we try to do is, is work on an air change rate that we think matches similar applications. So we typically go for between one and one and a half air changes an hour. So when you work out the subfloor area, which is, which of course, in, you'll get the area of the floor and, and multiply by the depth, you'll see that we only really need to be moving quite small volumes of air. But it's the combined effect, uh, effect of that air. So if you look at um, speed to on either supply or extract, six or seven litres of air a second. That, that's actually a very, very small amount of air. But, but if you multiply that by 60 to get a minute and 60 to get an hour and 24 to get a day, you know, you're knocking on the door of half a million litres of air that you can put through a subfloor. Um, 
So one of the other benefits of moving a, um, uh, at low volumes is that you can attach quite a bit of ductwork to it. So, um, and that's important when you're trying to distribute the air in the subfloor. Um, a key feature as well is that the running costs are low and these um, uh, um, kilowatt hour rates are, are way off, right? They, they probably double that now. But, but still, you, you know, on, its, on the highest setting, the system will, will typically, you know, cost less than £10 a year to run. So here's an application, just sort of a, a slide just showing um, the fan on supply mode. So simply blowing air into a subfloor. Um, extract mode. And, and what this fan also has is, um, is, is, is quite a unique feature, is that um, it's able to alternate. So if you choose to set the fan up, uh, the system up in this way, what, what you can effectively do is have one, air, one fan blowing air in for 70 seconds um, and a second fan taking air out. And then you can sync them so that you can get this pathway across a, across a subfloor. Typically, um, the, 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 the fans are mounted outside. There'll be a small sort of swan neck flexible duct down to um, a system of duct work that's within the subfloor. This slide shows um, a test that we did at our factory. We were trying to work out kind of what would be the maximum um, length of duct work we could put onto one of these fans and still achieve a good distribution of ventilation. Um, it's, it's, it's not shown well um, um, in this slide, but it was a smoke test. And it was really interesting to see the, 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 the system of duct work fill up with smoke and actually distribute out at, at, at the furthest point. That actually goes against some, some principles that we apply in, in my part of the industry, which is, you know, air will take the path of least resistance. So you would think that most of the air would be coming out of the, uh, the duct work closer to the, um, the fan system, but that just wasn't the case at all. It, it, it operated a, um, a lot like... Um, uh, a, a soft distributor so sometimes you see them in big buildings or car showrooms where it's a, a sock with lots of holes in and they're used to ventilate those areas and when the fans off they deflate um, so access to the subfloor is is sometimes limited but what you're able to do is mount the fan higher up and then and then form um, like a periscope duct system which you can get boxed in after um, here's an example of a typical um, uh, distribution. If you look through the literature, it'll give you some design ideas. But in truth, you know, you guys are the experts and you can pretty much do what you want with it. My advice is to think about the path of air that you're um, pulling across a space. You don't want dead spots, but that's exactly the same as if you were ventilating a, ventilating a, a home. Um, finally, um, as I said earlier, this, I'm pretty sure this is going to be our biggest selling product. Um, we get inquiries all of the time. People want them supplied and installed, and we don't have that capability. Uh, if it's something you're interested in being referred on to, then um, by all means take a brochure or call me, and, and, and let's have a chat about it. If, if you've got the capability to, to do this, then, then we, you know, and, and you let us know the area that, that, that you operate in, then, you know, I, I'd be delighted to, to sort of pass on those leads to you. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, so that's that session. Um, can we show these guys up another round of appreciation, please? And just another reminder, I think we've done it about five times, but they are all in about outside, so go and see them, go and have conversations with them. There is one bit of innovation that we haven't discussed, and um, I would like to sort of encourage you to go and seize the opportunity, particularly because our next session is going to be from the Housing Ombudsman. And a lot of that is about this sort of diagnostic approach to dampness in buildings. And, you know, we have Paola's... Uh, 
would we call it a tool now? Is it still a tool? Or is it is a tool um, where it will give you guidance on, on monitoring atmospheric conditions. So please go and see Paula as well. She'll be out in the foyer and she'll happily go and answer any questions you've got. So um, for, I'm hoping lunch, we're sticking with the same time, aren't we? We're still aiming to be back for 10 to 2. So um, please go and enjoy your food and uh, we'll see you back here shortly.